Good afternoon. I'm Jim Kadamas from Sightlines, along here with Ted Kale, um, and we're going to be presenting to you today the Unleash the Power of Prediction with Ropa Plus. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, just want a few housekeeping before we get a few housekeeping chairs before we get started. Uh, on the box here that is where you signed in, um, there's a place to type a message, and right where I've just clicked now, and if you type a message. We will be able to, with any questions as we go along the webinar, please do that. We're, at the end, we're going to take questions, and we'll be able to see those questions if you type them in, and re we'll respond to all the questions, uh, assuming we have time for the entire webinar. If not, we'll publish some responses to those questions online. So thanks again for joining us. We have about 25 folks on the line, and we're going to start the webinar right now. So a little bit about... Uh, the today's agenda. Um, we're going to start a little bit of background about Sightline story. Many of you, of course, you, you've all know, worked with Sightlines before, so we want to make sure you know where this new Ropa Plus piece fits in with all of the work that we've done over the years. Then we will give you an overview of Ropa Plus, um, the discovery, the prediction, and the performance aspects of it. And then we're going to go into some specific examples for the new parts of Ropa Plus, because all of you who are been with us for a number of years and experienced the discovery part of ROPA, uh, the ROPA process. But we're going to be adding prediction and performance parts today and show you some examples at specific campuses where we've used this to introduce you to these ideas. We're also going to introduce you to the Sightline's new member portal, which will come with the ROPA Plus process. It is a new access point for the website with a lot of new features. And then at the end, have some time for questions and discussion. A little bit about the Sunline story. Um, those who've been working with us for a long time know that we've been in business since 2000 when we started with six campuses. Um, we launched our capital planning services in 2003 in addition to our ROPA process. Uh, we launched our Go Green services in 2005 in partnership with Clean Air Co Planet, and all of those services continue to be in place in 2014. And in 2009, um, we were able to acquire the Pacific Partners Consulting Group. Um, Pacific Partners have been in business for about 25 years, and they had a, a predictive life cycle model called, that we've now returned capital renewal service, primarily used by state systems with some individual campuses, but it gave us some new tools to really understand capital planning and life cycles going out into the future. And so we've tried to think, begin to think the last couple of years about how to incorporate the, the information from capital renewal. In addition, by 2011, our database reached over a billion square feet. It's actually up to about 1.3 billion right now. So we have data on lots of campuses um, across the country, over 400 campuses right now. Uh, and when we look at all of the data that we have from both the ROPA process and capital renewal, it got us to really start thinking about expanding the ROPA service from simply a historical model that looked at trends and looked at the current conditions to one that can predict performance in the, predict, um, performance in the future and can also measure performance in the future and track that performance over time. So that's how we've gotten to ROPA Plus. When we take a look at um, the latest thing that we're rolling out later this year will be our new website which will give you access to lots of different tools that you can use online and dashboards that you can use online to be able to um, use ROPA more effect the ROPA data more effectively. Just a reminder about the vocabulary. We're not changing the ROPA vocabulary. We still have our return on physical assets vocabulary in four areas, annual stewardship or the cost of keeping up, uh, asset reinvestment, the community backlog of repair and modernization needs, and the resource capacity to address it, which is the cost of catching up. And our prediction models that we're going to be talking about today in ROPA Plus deal with both the keep up and the catch up costs, help us predict what the keep up costs are going to be in the future, and help us better define what those catch up costs are and how they can work together and be timed to time, then the timing of capital investments can be made to address both. In addition, we continue to collect lots of metrics around operations effectiveness and the service process. 
in the service process, and that is going to be part of our ROFA Plus performance benchmarking and our ability to track performance over time. The discovery process that we've had in ROPA, which is our historical process of discovery, really presents the campus story. And it presents the campus story that we've seen over time where if annual stewardship fails, failures and operational demands increase, and, or as annual stewardship falls, uh, failures and operational demands tend to increase, customer satisfaction decrease, and the backlog of deferred maintenance and needs increases. And this is our road for radar screen that you've seen and what we typically see happening in most campuses across the country. We've been trying to change the paradigm of that campus story to actually help people figure out ways to increase annual stewardship, decrease operating costs, increase customer satisfaction, and when we do are able to do that, we're finding that in fact the backlog declines and the actual radar chart tends to change shape. As you can see, the yellow gets bigger and begins to cover the red, which are the target areas. The radar, what we've discovered over the last few years is that, um, as part of the ROPA process, is that there are significant pressures facing higher education. Those pressures are coming in a number of different ways. If you're a public sector campus, we've seen decreasing support through state budgets, both of operating and capital costs, although we are seeing some states where Capital funding is beginning to increase as people recognize the needs, the aging of buildings, and the increasing deferred maintenance needs. It's also been great pressure to keep tuition stable, whether you're a public sector institution or a private sector institution. A lot of pressure to keep costs down and the cost of families down, keep tuition as low as possible and not have significant increases. And in many states, we've actually seen that the state has capped tuition increases. We're also seeing increasing expectations among faculty and students. Um, students wanting more services, wanting better um, uh, dorms and, and facilities on campus, expect faculty expecting to have state-of-the-art research facilities, classroom facilities, laboratory facilities, and the pressure coming more and more for that. We've also been looking at um, the need to, the, the pressures to become more accountable and more transparent. The federal government's been talking a lot about this. The state aid, state governments are talking a lot about this. The folks that are trying to that are asking are asking you to become uh, within your own campus to become more transparent, what you're doing, to have better metrics, to define it, to be able to be more accountable for results. The other two two big pressures are we're seeing increased deferred maintenance as capital budgets are limited, operational resources are limited and stretched even further. We're seeing the backlog of deferred maintenance up over the last five years by about 15 percent. We've been seeing some increases of about two to three dollars a square foot per year happening in terms of deferred maintenance. And then finally, the building age demographics. Um, we're seeing significant changes the demographics, the percentage of space over 25 years old growing, and in many states, the percentage of space over 50 years old growing in many campuses where campuses are just getting older even though and the people have not had the, the resources to reset the clock on buildings and change the age profile. This chart many of you may have seen in some of the, the publications that we've been putting out recently. It's a chart where we mapped our entire $1.3 billion square feet of space by the year in which the square footage was constructed, not renovated, but actually constructed. And you can see that as the baby boom generation came to college and as research facilities were being built on college campuses across the country, we saw starting in the late 50s, but particularly from around 1960 to 1975, more space was built on college campuses than, it was, than there was built cumulative in the 80 years prior to that. That spike of space is what is driving a lot of the deferred maintenance needs across college campuses right now. And that spike, if you look at every building that's been built between 1960 and 75, if they've not been renovated and the clock has not been reset, all of those buildings will become over 50 years old in the next decade. So that's 
are, what we're seeing is a growing catch-up need. In addition, a second spike that was really actually to address some of the baby boomers' children, the, boom, the baby boomlet, and a lot of increase in college going rate across the country, we saw again from around 2000, from about 1995 to around 2010, a second spike in um, space being constructed. And then that space now is 15 to 20 years old. Um, that space is in keep up mode right now, but will soon become, life cycles will start becoming due and we'll add that to the catch-up that we need to do, to, uh, that we already have and need to address from those 1960s and 1970s. Buildings. So these two waves of construction are really what's causing a lot of pressure among college campuses right now, and that many of you are feeling, where you've got this tremendous catch-up need of those over 25 and over 50 buildings having to deal with those, and the keep-up need of a lot of new space that was built since 1995. The question is, how does this impact current and future capital investment needs and influence capital, uh, influence operational performance? So the phase of the, the phases of Roca Plus really start with discovery, which is, you're all familiar with. You've all gone through this process where you are, we are collecting extensive amounts of base data over 200 different metrics, developing trends and benchmarking around those metrics. Um, developing a common vocabulary for you to use across the campus, both from facilities and finance all the way up through your trustees and your boards and ultimately through, through the state um, systems if you're part of a state system. And we've been able to define facility relationships, the relationship between capital, capital planning and operational planning, the relationship between operating effectiveness and service, the relationship between keep up and catch up. All of that has been part of that discovery process. With Roca Plus, we're adding two additional phases. We're keeping that discovery process and annually updating it just like you have now, but we're adding that prediction model that, is, uh, that we've been able to create using the capital renewal database as well as our extensive experience over the last 14 years in business to be able to now predict what those capital needs are going to be going out in the future to better understand facility risks and the needs of the risks that are being presented by the age profile and deferred maintenance that you have and be able to identify future operating targets to predict where you need to be relative to campus operations. The third phase that we're adding and continuing the discovery and the prediction phases is a performance phase where we are going to be setting up essentially key performance indicators, a way of tracking performance, not only against your peers, as we've always done, going back to the discovery process, but against the best-in-class institutions. That is, institutions that look like you, but how are they performing and who are the best performing? Often many of you ask, gee, I'm improving, but how now am I, I'm doing well against my peers, but how am I doing against the best-in-class? And be able to set specific goals and targets for your institution and highlight your progress in setting those goals, a way of making you becoming more accountable for your performance. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the details of this and then I'm going to ask Ted Kahl, who's our senior director, to be able to do some, show you some specific examples. First, to release the power of the Sightlines database, we not only have on the right-hand side that $1.3 billion of there's 1.3 row square feet of higher education facility information that deals with a whole range of areas. But now we're adding to that life cycle data on over 220 campuses that makes the prediction possible. This is what we've been able to do through our purchase of the Pacific Partners Consulting Group and their development of the capital renewal model. We have life cycle data on 15 subsystems, building subsystems for over 300 million square feet and building type and subsystem project costs on over 5,000 buildings. When we add those together, it allows us to create, to release the power of prediction. That is, we now, if you, the, the, tar, the chart here that's showing on your screen right now, is the traditional ROPA chart that you've seen. We show annual stewardship, we show asset reinvestment, we show a target need, we show an equilibrium need. Our ability to predict uh, now allows us to be able to say, what will those needs look like going out into the future? 
what are the future capital needs that are going to be coming due as you continue to have a backlog that you need to address and now add in the life cycle needs that are coming due with these building systems. In addition, it allows us to be able to look at a risk profile um, where we are identifying types of work that needs to be done that present high risk, medium risk, and lower risk so that you can create a capital execution strategy on the timing of when you want to address these peaks and need and as well as address the key risks that are coming due. More to come on this as Ted's going to show you some specific examples. On the performance side, taking that extensive database we now have and all of what we've learned about the relationships, one of the examples we showed you is plan maintenance. So the blue is where your campus is, and the black are all of your peer campuses and other campuses where we've actually plotted, looking at the dollars per square foot on uh, uh, the spending on plan maintenance and a three-year change over time. And what we've been able to do is identify some dots that are what we call our best in class. These are people, these are campuses that actually are look like you, but are actually performing at a much higher level, that is, they are either spending the same but improving rapidly, or they're spending more and improving rapidly over time. And so we're able to show um, how you might look at changing your practices and plan of preventive maintenance in order to reach new goals and become to look more like the people who are best in class. So the value here is to be able to identify those best in class institutions and for you to be able to set goals and track performance against those goals so you can become one of the best in class institutions. On any one of any one of our metrics, we've just chosen plan maintenance as an example here. So um, I want to show you now some specific examples, starting with the prediction model. And I'm going to ask Ted Kell to start up here. Yeah, thanks, Tim. So when we get into the prediction piece, we're plus prediction, we're going to be changing the conversation. And by that I mean when you look at these two areas, backlog and deferred maintenance, they're generally very large numbers, can be scary numbers, and oftentimes there's not a lot of context when they're being presented uh, for a lot of institutions. Well, I'll say that that's only half the story when it comes to capital investments over the next 10 years. The other half are renewal or life cycle needs. And this is where we talk about presenting the complete picture. And when we've done analysis at looking at total needs over a 10-year time frame, yeah, backlog, that gets the most attention out there in, in higher ed right now. But these renewal needs are an other element that, that often go uh, unplanned for. And this is where Ropa Plus, we want to bring the both together so we tell the complete story for capital investments. Now, to show in an actual example what happened at a particular institution and why just looking at backlog doesn't tell the full story, the chart to the left, $125 million backlog of need back in 2006 for this particular campus. Now, since 2006 and 2013, that seven-year time frame, they invested $125 million. So if you're all in the same room right now, I'd ask for a show of hands, who thinks their backlog is zero? And, and the, the real answer behind this, when we look at their updated analysis in 2013, their backlog total was $130 million. So then that raises another question, well, how is that possible? Does that make sense? And that's what I'll explain on this next slide. So in 2006, we have that $125 million backlog need. And then we have these yellow boxes. These yellow boxes represent the renewal or life cycle needs that are coming due on an annual basis. So this assumes that based upon that 2006 initial backlog, if this institution were to invest $0, their backlog will grow to 2013 to over $250 million. But we know that their current backlog in 2013 is $130 million. And a mistake that's often made at small campuses, large campuses, public, private, or even state systems is they can compare that initial 2006 backlog to the 2013 backlog. And then that's when Board of Trustees, the senior staff, will ask, you were given $125 million to invest and now you're telling me we're worse off. And the reason behind that is they lose sight of those yellow boxes, which are the renewal needs that are continually coming due. And that's why Ropa Plus, we're presenting the complete picture, which you need to focus not only on the backlog, but also the renewal needs that are coming due. 
So when, what we're going to do is with Ropa Plus, there's a couple different scenarios and examples, but I wanted to highlight some of the differences between discovery, what you had in terms of an asset reinvestment needs, and what the differences are with Ropa Plus. For those of you, you're all, right, all familiar with their asset reinvestment needs, this is a different example of a different institution. Their total asset reinvestment need was $228 million, which this, this particular campus is around 4 million square feet, so it's about a $60 square foot backlog. Okay? So you get a lump sum backlog estimate with discovery, and they're, they're provide, that provides value in the sense you get a total number and it's benchmarked to peers, so you have some context and other element of the overall growth of story. But what it doesn't tell you is the risk level of that and provide the sequencing of timing when those needs will come due. So what we do with Ropa Plus prediction is we break that $228 million out in three different buckets. We look at the blue, the $88 million, which are the renewal needs or life cycle needs that are coming due over the next 10 years. We look at $39 million in immediate needs. Those are needs that really should be done in the next one to two years. And then we have longer term projects that make up the $102 million. So that way we provide a greater level of risk when it comes to total needs. Then the next element that we also provide is, is the sequencing or the timing of when they should, when these uh, needs are coming due. Here you can see the renewal needs and there's a fluctuation, they fluctuate because some systems have different life cycles and there, therefore you can see over the next 10 years when things are going to spike and when they're going to be lower. Then we bring in the immediate needs over the next two years and then we have the remaining uh, uh, 102 million over the, the last eight years. So this provides a total investment in terms of sequencing and total needs over that 10 year time span. And we recommend that you invest the blue, the renewal dollars, because if you don't invest into those renewal dollars, well, things are going to fail. And if you're familiar with sight lines, if things fail, it's going to cost you more in the long run. So by investing in the blue, that will ensure that the systems will last their full useful life. So that's an overview of some of the differences. But now we're going to a couple different examples and different scenarios. So we have that same campus, the $228 million in total need. But now we also had a conversation, well, what are, what's your investment capacity over that 10-year time period? It turned out that it was $150 million, which if you divide that by 4 million square feet, $3.75 a square foot. So we're talking about an institution that really is investing less than our database average, which is closer to $5 a square foot. So what we did was the first step, we said, let's take that 150, divide it by 10, and that's $15 million each year. The key takeaway of this slide is they don't have all the resources to, to address all the things that are coming due, so they need to make decisions about, okay, well, what's the best way to allocate our capital over that time period? And that's where we got a little creative with them in developing different scenarios. The first scenario looked at a fixed funding approach. So over that 10-year period, we said, okay, we're just going to invest $15 million each year, but we're also going to fully fund the renewal needs, the blue, so that way we're staying on top of those and we're not making the situation worse. The, the problem with that scenario was, was that you can see that the gray immediate needs, those immediate needs which really should be done in the first two years, they're going to be spread out over the next six years. So there, there was an issue with that, but this kept to the constraints of only having the 15 million fixed each year. The next scenario, what we did was we shifted some of the blue out into the future. So the reason we were able to shift some of those renewal needs was because they had an effective plan maintenance program. Therefore, they maintained their systems at very high levels. And as a result, they extended their life cycles. So they were able to shift some of the renewal needs out in the future, which gave them the capacity to address more of their immediate needs in the short term. So this, when it comes to this scenario and shifting the investment mix, in the first four years, they could address the immediate needs, which was more favorable to the conditions on that campus. The final scenario that we looked at was a capital campaign. And they knew they were going to get a capital campaign in 16, 17, and 18. So we said, well, let's look at that. Or if you're a public school, you might know when a bond, a new bond's coming due. And it, you, we can adjust that scenario for that particular instance. And, and so we modeled this and looked at, well, what would it look like in terms of where their needs would be and how much resources they would have. Another interesting example occurred that there was a capital campaign for a different institution for the years 14, 15, and 16. But then they saw out in 
2019, 2020, and 2021, there were significant needs coming due in some residence halls uh, throughout the campus. And they said, well, since we have the money in these first three years, can we address some of those uh, items out in the future being proactive about it? And like I said, for every dollar invested today, it might save three to four dollars out in the future. So they were able to get a handle on some of those needs today when they have the resources to do it, and therefore making everything on the operational side more effective. Okay. So those are the three different scenarios, and that's something that we would work through with the campus on, depending on what their funding allocation is, how much they have, what those scenarios might be. So some key takeaways of the value prediction. It's a capital planning tool to predict investment levels and risk. It provides an execution strategy in terms of the sequencing and timing of those investment needs. And like I mentioned, we can highlight various investment scenarios over the next 10 years. So the next section, Ropa Plus performance. And Jim touched on this a little bit, utilizing our, our database of 1.3 billion square feet. And, and I'll highlight a couple different examples here, but first there's a few steps in the performance process that we'll cover. And when we're talking about performance, the first step is, well, we have a conversation with the campus on, well, what are some areas of focus that you want to look into? Because as you all know, there's an immense amount of data in our ROPA process. And just by having a conversation around a few items provides a focus or a targeted approach to certain areas that you want to change. So that's the first thing. What are the areas you want to focus on? And what are some of the potential goals? We'll provide data of identifying best-in-class institutions, depending on the particular metric you want to look at. We'll work with you on setting targets to achieve those goals, and then we'll be tracking performance. We'll be tracking performance in our final presentations, but I'll also talk about how we're integrating some of that into the new member portal that we'll be releasing soon. So to go into an example, you're probably all familiar with the chart that looks like this. It's plain maintenance, dollars per square foot, over time. This is what historically we've provided in our ROPA analysis. So this is what we would cover in the discovery update. However, we're going one step uh, further into the ROPA Plus performance piece. And Jim talked briefly about this particular slide. And what we look at here, as he mentioned, the y-axis looks at the percent change in plan maintenance investment, the x-axis looking at the total investment. And the first question when we started developing this was, can you be a best-in-class institution only if you can afford to be? And, and the answer to that is no, which frankly makes the analysis that much more difficult. But we wanted to identify institutions that were the best given their challenges as well as their resources. So you might have an institution that has incredibly high density factor, they're very technically complex building, and they might not have all the resources, but given those resources, they are very effective, and as a result, they're a best-in-class. So there's a lot of correlation and statistical analysis behind that, and given our database of 1.3 billion square feet, we have the ability to do that now. So what we're looking at here in this example is all those black dots, they're all the institutions in that database. Let's take those away, and what you'll see is that we have a best-in-class target line and then you can see the blue where your particular campus is, and then where peer institutions are. Now, you're not going to become the best overnight. So there will be a series of targets that it takes to get to that level. And in this instance, what we worked out with this particular school was that they just wanted to reach peer levels in 2014. So in 2014, what would the cost impact be, and what are some of the other factors that might play into becoming relatively close to peers or at the peers for the 2014 target? So we model that. Then looking at 2015, well, they realized you know, we're not going to reach the best-in-class target line, uh, so we need a, a bridge between those two years. And we modeled out what it would look like in 2015, so that way for 2016, we might be able to reach that best-in-class. But the thing is, the best continually, if they are truly the best, they will continue to improve. And we need to factor for that. And that's something that we'll be calculating on an annual basis and figuring out, well, who's the best this year? And so we were anticipated that the best will improve, so we had to go a little bit further for the 2016 target so that they would achieve that best-in-class target. Now, they just wanted to reach it for this one particular metric. Typically, you know, an institution, there might be only a few areas where they are the best in a particular thing, 
And this will mean a focus on plain maintenance, because they knew the benefit of that proactive approach for their institution. So this was one analysis of many that we, that we did for the particular school when it came to their performance analysis. So the key takeaways and the value of performance, we highlight best-in-class institutions to inform future goals. We measure performance first goals instead of historic trends. And I, I see this as a, as a key because the ROPA data, it provides longitudinal historic trends, and that's how historically we've matched or measured performance, where now we're measuring performance first those future goals, which is a, a switch in our overall analysis. Um, and that's where we process, we process to identify goals in order to track and report performance. And then the final area, which I'll go over, we integrate these dashboards with the SiteLine's new member portal, which will be released in the coming months. So that's where I'll cover some of the new features of the member portal, but that's a key element of performance and how it ties to the member portal and some of the features you'll have when it comes to tracking progress over time. So the SiteLine's new member portal. Um, there was a lot of work that went into this, uh, a lot of feedback from uh, a lot of our members into some of the features and uh, uh, different attributes of the new member portal, which we incorporated into the overall design. And this is something we're very excited about releasing in the coming months. And uh, hopefully it'll make everyone's e job easier when it comes to running benchmarks or charts or pulling in data. So I have a couple screenshots. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more information here that will be coming soon. But I just have a couple of screenshots that I want to cover for today um, and a couple points. Uh, the first of which is there'll be, there'll be notifications, live notifications of your data if things change, if we upload data to your website or if you upload data to your website. There will be live notifications. You'll have the ability to customize dashboards. So like I said, if you want to look at a particular performance dashboard, you'll have the ability to have some customization around that. You'll still have the ability to continually benchmark all, uh, all the historic benchmarks that you've had in the past with your peer groups or our database as a whole. And then we're also adding a My Story feature. Um, and that's where feedback comes where we have, we've heard that we provide a lot of context and a, and, a, and, a, and a good story when we present the material. But then when we leave and go to the website, you know, some of that context is lost. Well, that's where we've added the My Story feature, and we're providing talking points from our presentation and other material so that that story continues even after we leave campus. Another screenshot that we have and some other areas, more foresight in terms of the predictive analytics um, and looking at the performance tracking, more data in terms of drilling down into the details behind some of the benchmarks, in some of the areas, if you have a benchmark, you can click into it and the data pulls up. And then the final feature, which I think most people uh, will get the most amount of ex excitement from, is building and customizing your own benchmarks. So that's where if you had an idea for a past benchmark, um, this is where you can build that and customize it to your particular institution. So that's one of the key features I think a lot of people are looking forward to. And obviously, there'll be a, a, there'll be a new interface and look of it with the hopes of making it easy, easier for everyone to have access to it and uh, pulling out their data or benchmarks uh, or whatever you need from the website. And now I will pass it over to Jim. So just to summarize, part of what we're feeling is that we need to use Roca Plus to help you change the conversation about campus facilities to get uh, more people involved, to get your senior administration involved, your staff more involved. And Ruffle Plus really, I think, helps, helps with that process. It helps with the process of prediction because we're creating now a capital tool that will predict capital investment levels and understand future risks and help you think more about how to create an execution strategy for capital investment funding. Um, as Ted pointed out, we're trying to help you answer that question well, we're giving you all this money, you're spending this money, you keep telling me the backlog hasn't changed. How can you execute a strategy where you can both deal with the backlog and future life cycle and be able to take those both into consideration and make progress so that that number actually begins to shrink? And it highlights the impact of various investment scenarios. We'll be able to take what you're telling us that you have in terms of resources, when you're going to have those resources, do I have fixed funding? Do I have variable funding? Am I going to have a capital campaign campaign coming? Is there a state bond act coming? Be able to predict all those types of scenarios and be able to 
to, to map out what the possibilities are in terms of capital execution. It's when you get those infusions of money that you want to be able to address the backlog without ignoring the life cycles coming due in the future. In the performance side, we're going to give you a process to identify future goals, to track in, in ways of tracking progress, and how important is this going to be as you present to your senior officials, to the president, to your trustees, to be able to tell them um, we're making progress and here are the goals that we set and here's our measures of progress. One way, great way of engaging your board is to be able to talk to them about measures of progress and tracking progress over time. And so measuring performance versus goals rather than just historic trends are something that we're trying to get more, more and more involved in here through the plus process. And finally, being able to track, identify, and benchmark the best in class. Um, being able to pick those metrics where you are the best in class and be able to show people that, but also be able to say, here are areas where we think we need to get better and where we not only just want to be as good as peers, but for many of you who are working with us for a long time, you're at the top of the peer group. You want to be the best in class, and you want to be able to prove it to, your, to, to decision makers on your campus. And then finally, with the new member portal, more customization, to build your own benchmark so that, you know, some of the things that you may say, gee, you know, this is not something you track nationwide, but something that we want specifically for our own campus, be able to have those built right into the website so it's not something that you've got to call a special for. More data, to be able to drill down into details behind your analysis to really see what the, what, what's behind some of these metrics and understand how that the, the, the metrics are changing over time, and more context with the campus story that we will be able to highlight key points from your rope analysis, um, from presentations that we make, so you've got access to that story all the time, and when people want, when, when you need to make presentations, you can draw on that story. So some of the questions we've got, first question I would ask is, okay, how much is this going to cost? Since uh, I currently have the ROPA process, what additional costs would be for me to have the prediction and the performance and the new member portal access across the board? And we've given you some ranges um, by square footage. Um, if this is additional on top of your current um, ROPA uh, annual renewal, so we think we try to keep these pretty modest and scaled by size of campus so that you're able to um, take advantage of some of these key capital planning tools and these performance dashboards and these performance metrics and be able to um, purchase this as part of your ROPA renewal. And the reason we're having the webinar now is that many of you are coming up for renewal and we want to encourage you to be able to take advantage of the ROPA Plus and this ROPA Plus pricing. Um, ultimately, um, and, and for those of you who have talked to new members, uh, new member campuses, um, since last year we have only been selling Ropa Plus to everybody. So all the new campuses have found since basically last June uh, have come, come have started up with a three-year plan for Ropa Plus discovery, prediction, performance. So now we're really trying to get our existing members to kind of be able to ha take advantage of the same tools that. Your colleagues are now, your new colleagues are not get, now getting, and this allows you to do that at a very modest uh, increase in price. Finally, for questions, when I open up for questions, but we also want to tell you how to get in touch with us, and that is um, for Ropa Plus, um, you should contact your regional account executive that you've been working with at Sightline, or you can reach us at 203-682-4950, or just email us at insights at sidelines.com to I'd like to talk more about this. For those of you who are having your final uh, final presentations in the next few months, um, you'll get a chance to talk to your um, your staff, the sideline staff to come on campus and be able to look at um, some of these Ropa Plus examples and see how they might work for your campus. But in the meantime, um, please give us a call or contact your Ropa, your your sidelines regional account executive or email us. Um, and so that's basically we want to open this up now for questions. Uh, we've been tracking questions that people have been emailing in. We've got about a half a dozen questions so far. So um, while we're going to start answering those, we encourage you to write in the questions in the box that I showed you. Again, I'll show that to you one more time. It's on this panel here, and there's a place to 
at to do to do uh, um, write questions right here. Write your question in, and we'll get that, and we'll answer as many as we can over the next so, 20 minutes. So, Ted, do you have a question for us? Yeah, there's uh, three questions. There's three uh, recent write-ins here on top of some others as we're going through. Um, will you be breaking, and I'm just going to read the question, and we'll go on the answer. Will you be breaking out that information uh, uh, by academic and housing facilities? This was in reference to slide 10, the prediction over the next 10 years. So I'd say if you go to slide 10 there, Jim, I'll answer. Um, if you have a, a multi-campus breakout at your particular campus, so let's say you have ENG or academic size and housing already broke out, we will be uh, we will be separating it out between academic and housing. So if, if you have a breakout of space um, on your campus, uh, currently like with how we've done it on the Ropa side, we do have the capacity to break it out on the Ropa Plus prediction side as well. So the answer to that is yes, that we will have that ability. Uh, the the follow-up question to that was, um, how does this align with those working on an integrated facilities plan, an IFP, or a building portfolio? Um, and the comment was, I do not think uh, Ropa Plus is as detailed. Uh, is that correct? And this was in reference to slide 18. So before we go to that, just one other addition on the slide 10. Um, the reason it would be very powerful to break this out between academic and housing is that they have different sources of funding, right? Mm -hmm. um, and many of the campuses, housing runs as an auxiliary, uses the, the, the board that is, that is paid for by students to as a funding source and has a little bit more flexibility. So being able to know different funding sources and be able to look at your, say, your ENG space, education general space versus your housing space and run these models independently, I think that would make a lot of sense for people and um, we can look at resource capacity in each one in terms of running the model. Yep. Let me turn to that IFP question. Go ahead, slide 18. Uh, that's what was mentioned here, yes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Let me see slide 18. So th that, that is correct. Um, when it comes to an IFP or building portfolio, there'd be a lot, there's a lot more analysis and detail around that. When it comes to the Robo Plus prediction, if you look at this slide out into the future, this is a higher level view. We would present this at a campus view. Or if you just had the ENG side versus like housing, we would break it out at that level. We wouldn't break out that prediction at a building level view. But whereas in IFT, you would break out at a building level view. You would also have a project scoring associated with that, building portfolios and capital plan associated with that. Where with the uh, Robo Plus prediction, it's a campus of uh, total need over the next 10 years by risk and the sequencing of that. So there is a difference in terms of the detail between the two services. Well, where, where they would fit together, though, is that um, IFP data can be used to populate this information very easily in terms of Ropa Plus and being able to get that kind of information out. Second, one of the things that we've heard from some of the campuses that do the IFP with us is that they don't feel that the X time frame projects are very reliable and that this model may help them get a better handle on those X time frames and for IFP clients, I think we can actually take this out further than 10 years because we we'll already have a much more powerful database with them. So that's something that if you're an IFP campus, we want to talk a little bit more about that and about being able to give you a predictive model beyond the 10 years and really define better what that X time frame looks like. Remember, everything is A, B, C, and then X. And so maybe C and X become important areas that help get clarified by Roca Plus. Then the other one uh, is in reference to scenario three with slide 21. Uh, slide 21, okay, so in scenario three, do the bars represent capital expenditures or funding available for a renewal project? So the bars on that chart to the right, they represent, um, well, what we did was based upon the bonding or the capital campaign that came due in 2016 through 18, we said, okay, Given that funding source, which is the orange dotted line, um, the total is still 150 million, but they knew they were going to get an infusion in those three years. We shifted some of the needs so that way they would address a lot of immediate needs in those three years. So the bars represent items that are coming due or items that they should do um, in the time frame that we're looking at. So those are actually basically uh, needs that are coming due that they'll have to make an investment for. So it's a case where there's an infusion of capital and you're saying, okay, knowing that I'm going to get an infusion of capital in 16, 17, and 18, 
what's my mix, what's my project mix versus um, in 14 and 15 where only I've got about eight, seven or eight million dollars to work with, and then in 19 through 21 where I've got about you know 13 million to work with. So this is a typical that we see in a lot of campuses where they get an infusion of money for a short period of time. And people ask questions, well, you know, what should I do? Um, what's my mix of immediate needs, long-term backlog needs, as well as renewal needs that I should be addressing during that time? Sure. Then another question that came up was, uh, what additional data do we need for the, the Ropa Plus piece? And I would say there's, there's kind of two elements to that. Uh, for the prediction piece, that will require another meeting. And what we do is we look at through the buildings and we focus on six core subsystems. Those six subsystems based upon, if you recall, that capital renewal database of over 220 campuses of life cycle needs. We've taken the cost database of that and we consolidated, you know, what might be 15 to 20 subsystems down to six core subsystems that equate to about 98% of the overall building. And, and then we review, okay, when those subsystems are coming due for each of your buildings. And that way we're able to populate this future graph out over the next 10 years. So there's an additional meeting and analysis of the building inventory to populate the prediction. Then on the performance, there's also one meeting that we'll, uh, we'll need to talk through that process of what are the areas you want to focus on, what are potential targets you want to shoot for, and once we get that feedback from you, we would develop the analysis. Around those areas. What are those? What are those six subsystems? Building subsystems. Uh, roof, uh, building roof, exterior, mechanical, interior, electrical, and plumbing. Okay, so kind of the core ones that we found that make up about 98 percent of the building needs. So you don't have to go through detailed, you know, 20 different subsystems that we see in some of these areas, but. Um, and yeah. and that's why when we when we present this, we present it at we roll it up at a campus view is by only modeling out six subsystems to get that really detailed building analysis. Uh, we just have a great deal of confidence by rolling it up at campus view. And that's why we feel confident going out in the next 10 years at that. Uh, or if we had to break it out between an ENG and an auxiliary uh, view, we would feel comfortable doing that. But that's why you're not seeing individual building details here. Right. Um, one of the questions that just, we just got in was uh, on the IFP. What we meant by IFP, I didn't, didn't spell that out. IFP refers to Integrated Facilities Plan, which is a, um, a comprehensive process that allows us to look at building needs through a facilities condition assessment, look at integrating those building needs with future life cycle data, and being able to help you develop a multi-year capital plan using building portfolios, uh, kind of as investment portfolios over time. So um, it's a process that we've done with a lot of our campuses now that really helps them advance their capital planning and being able to have a great greater impact in terms of advocating for funding and having an impact on need. So there's another question. Go ahead. Uh, if they were not to buy Ropa Plus, what does the member portal look like? And to answer that is everyone uh, has, there's a new member portal that will be releasing, but there's certain features and elements of that that you would not receive unless you have Ropa Plus. To give you an example, there's a drill-in detail that I mentioned um, that if you're on a chart, if you were to click that into that chart, more data would show up around the details of that particular benchmark. You would not get that feature um, if you remained a Ropa member. Uh, you would also not be able to get really the key feature, which is creating a customized benchmark or chart uh, for your particular campus. So that feature you wouldn't get unless you uh, move forward with Ropa Plus. But they kind of go together, right? Because if you're going to be developing those performance and prediction models and greater performance, you're going to want to have new dashboard tool in place. Um, if you don't go that direction, then you know it's not as critical to have access to those. But that certainly is something that um, you're going to. I think it, as you looked at the member portal here, as Ted showed you, I think there's a lot of. Uh, new features that are going to be pretty exciting for people that make it a lot easier to run your benchmarks and definitely want to be able to get a situation where um, if you're involved in the prediction and performance pieces, you're going to be able to to be able to use these tools, um, website tools, a lot better. Do you have another question, Ted? Um, here. The uh, best in class, so let me try to read this. Is basically how do you determine the best-in-class institutions on the performance piece? Um, and, and really, 
when it comes to that, like I said, the first question was, can you only be a best in class if you can afford to be? And to give to give an example, um, let's let's take a custodial example. Because one school they want to look at custodial performance, and they were covering around forty five thousand gross square feet per FTE, which our database, if you're familiar with, is around thirty two thousand gross square feet per FTE. Um, and then what we looked at was, okay, they're covering more space, but what are some of the challenges that are going on on campus? And when we looked at their density, their density, which is users per uh, uh, student faculty and staff, which is the volume of people going through it, it was incredibly high. And then when we tied that to their cleanliness inspection, their cleanliness inspection was really good. So if we factored for all these different metrics and we said, well, based upon one, the resources available, and then the output in terms of the cleanliness inspection and then the customer satisfaction survey results, we identified this institution as a best in class. So this is where we pull all that historic data along with determining in that database we have of 1.3 billion square feet and determining given the resources and the challenges on a campus, who really is a best in class institution. So there's a lot of analysis around that that we put together for a school in each particular metric. So that, that's how we would identify who's best in class. So I just want to spend the last couple of minutes here. And if you got any other questions, uh, please send them in. I think we've answered all the questions that we've received so far. I um, just want to review a couple of slides with you. Slide eight again, which shows the three phases. So right now, um, we're going to ask the question, what am I getting beyond what I have now? Right now, all of you who are ROPA members are in the discovery. Um, you get discovery every year, updated every year, where you're basically getting your base data, your trends and benchmarking, vocabulary, the facility relationship between operations and capital, capital spending backlog, age profile, density, technical complexity, all of the various metrics. Um, that will continue whether you retain and remain as a ROPA member or you go to ROPA Plus. By upgrading a ROPA Plus, you're adding the prediction model, which allows you to predict future capital needs understand the facility's risk, gives you the ability to identify future targets, both from an operation and capital standpoint, and really helps you with that capital execution that we talked about. And in addition, you get the prediction model, you're also going to be getting, Broker Plus includes the performance model, so you get both. Um, and the performance model allows you to track your performance versus best in class and against goals that you are setting and be able to measure yourself against those goals. So that's the the, the, the pieces that would be added, the prediction and the performance. And as we say, each year you would continue to get the discovery. And we, when we talk about these as phases, um, for new clients, we tend to, to, to um, offer these each year. So first year is discovery, then the second year discovery plus prediction, third year discovery plus prediction plus performance. But as you come in as an existing client, you know, we're going to discuss how you want to phase this and the timing of this. We know there's a lot here. And so adding these in, but we typically probably see these coming in over a couple-year period.